excited about this. This is the uh, final presentation from the Kansas State uh, grad students on our um, reimagining the Southeast Commercial Corridor group district in uh, Corville. And I've seen some of the um, presentations earlier on as they were working on them. They were exciting and I think you'll enjoy what you see. I know the, the guys and girls have done a lot of hard work and uh, we're really excited about it. And so uh, with that I'll turn it over to Blake Bellinger and Maggie. Hi, I'm Maggie Egberts. I think most of you either have already met me or met me last time. Um, I'm with the Technical Assistance to Brownfields program. We're the one kind of funding and helping provide the assistance um, for this project. And I just wanted to take a quick moment to say thank you to those that are present here today and those who have been serving on the CAP. Um, when it comes to economic revitalization, Brownfields redevelopment, it really cannot happen without community support and community champions, and that's what you guys are acting as. Um, so I just want to say thank you um, for your support, and um, yeah, thanks. Today is a really, really special day for this group of students, and I hope for the city of Coralville, because these guys and, and women in this room have been working very, very hard on this project for the last seven and a half weeks. So the work you're gonna see today is, um, the efforts that have resulted from literally seven and a half weeks of student work. Uh, the faculty have been working with TAB and the city of Coralville for uh, months ahead of time to prepare it, but the work that you're going to see came about in a relatively short period of time. The, the summer course that these students are taking are in the Department of Landscape Architecture and Regional and Community Planning at Kansas State University. And it's a community planning and design course. So these are landscape architecture graduate students. And this course focuses on, focuses on developing communities. Uh, the agenda for today is I'm going to start with a very brief introduction. We, we're getting a little bit of a late start, so I'm going to move through it pretty quickly. I'm, I'm going to just quickly outline the process we went through this summer. And I am going to also talk about uh, some of the influential conditions that drove our all of our student projects. Uh, there will be seven design team presentations. Each presentation will be 10 minutes long and it will be followed by five minutes for clarif clarification questions. Um, after that, we'll have some concluding remarks and uh, we invite you to join us at the Reunion Brewery down the street for an exhibit of all of the student projects and an opportunity to talk with the students about their work. Um, we only have five minutes for um, clarification questions after the presentations, so um, we really, really encourage you, if you want to learn more than you can get out of that five minute question and answer period, please come to the exhibit afterwards and uh, engage the students. They want to talk to you, they want to hear what your questions are, and they want to uh, continue to advance the dialogue of uh, community planning in Southeast Coralville. So the process that we went through, many of you I recognize uh, in this room were involved in the community engagement meeting on May 24th. It was a planning workshop that uh, was focused on identifying the needs and priorities of the community and we resulted in eight themes that helped drive our students' work. Uh, after that meeting, students engaged in two weeks of rigorous research and development of over 100 research-based maps that yielded a whole set of uh, design strategies that, that really helped shape the foundation for all of their design proposals. After that, the class was divided into seven teams. These are teams of three to four students. The teams went through an iterative process of design development, uh, resulting in um, a series of design proposals. The, the three overriding goals for the whole studio were first to develop a complementary viable concept or set of concept alternatives that would help contribute to the planning dialogue for the Southeast Commercial District. To integrate public or meaningful public participation in the design process, which we did through the May 24th planning workshop, as well as um, some check-ins with the city staff and one check-in with the, the advisory panel. And then uh, lastly, to address the influential, influential site and contextual conditions. The deliverables, so what you'll see today, uh, are really five different parts. The first is strategies for addressing significant site and contextual conditions. Uh, the design proposals themselves, which involve a site plan uh, and di diagrams that support the site plan. 
images of place experience. So these are sort of evocative images of what it would feel like to be experiencing the, des the designs that the students have generated. Um, quantitative metrics that will identify the uh, square footages of floor area for buildings and the development proposals, as well as outdoor open space area. And then lastly, phasing strategies, because phasing will be an absolutely vital part of this redevelopment project. So the eight influential conditions that emerged from the community planning workshop, as well as through our research, are first of all streets. And the, this intersection is one of the highest, or the highest volume intersection in all of Coralville. Um, particularly, Second Street carries um, almost, or over 25,000 uh, average annual trips per day. It's very hard to cross. It's actually extremely dangerous to cross anywhere except for the intersection. However, the walking distance to get from uh, the intersection at Second, or uh, First Avenue, to any other crosswalk is um, such that it's psychologically uh, detriment. People won't do it just because it's too far to, to, to walk. It's just it's too far. Um, the second issue is the waterfront, that the existing strip development that exists along the, the streets turns its back on both the uh, Clear Creek and the Iowa River. And we see opportunities to take advantage of that waterfront frontage. Um, the third issue is brownfield conditions. There are known perceived and assumed contamination um, on various parcels throughout the study area. Rail is our fourth uh, consideration. And we, we see rail not as a, as a dilemma, but as an opportunity. Uh, there have been feasibility studies to see what the possibilities are for commuter and or light rail on these two rail lines. And we see that these two lines come together within the study area, and that creates a tremendous opportunity as our first group will uh, talk about in depth. The high voltage transmission lines that pass through the site create a dilemma. They uh, pass through the site at an angle, fragmenting the parcels and creating uh, odd-shaped development lots. So every single group has addressed this one way or the other, either keeping them, taking them underground in their current location, or relocating them. Flooding, obviously, historically, has been a tremendous dilemma for this study area. Um, the city's uh, flood mitigation program, which protects the area to a 500 foot or 500 year floodplain plus a foot, uh, protects the air or protects the area practically from flooding. However, um, in order to meet FEMA requirements, all new development must be above the FEMA 100 year floodplain plus a foot. So all of this, the uh, design proposals address that requirement. Placemaking is obviously important for any new community district. So the, the fact that this study area exists at the edge of Coralville and can serve as a gateway to Iowa City, as a threshold between these two communities, and as an opportunity to embrace the historical and, and cultural heritage of Coralville, is a tremendous opportunity that all of the, the plans have taken advantage of. And lastly, the community expressed a desire for a mix of uses. This should not just be a commercial area or an educational area or just a residential area, but rather it should be a rich, diverse set of uses that can contribute to a sense of community. So these eight influential conditions were addressed by every team in different ways. This table shows um, the, the dilemmas across the top, or I shouldn't call them dilemmas, they're really just conditions. They're, they are existing conditions that were very influential. And then as you look down, you can see how each of our, our seven teams address those dilemmas in a different way. And we have handouts for that. This, uh, we don't actually expect you to get a whole lot out of this and like in terms of the details that you're gonna hear from the teams. But what we do hope you see from this is that every team considered all eight of these conditions and they were very influential to the development of their design proposals. I'd like to invite our first team, Regional Hub, to come up and lead us off. I forgot to say one thing. All of you, when you walked in, received a feedback form. And what this is, is it has uh, a couple of images from each project, as well as a couple of questions for you to address. And so as the students are presenting, or even after the presentations, if you could just jot down your ideas about um, what you think the best ideas of the proposal are, or what you would like to change about it. Um, that provides really good feedback for the students as they move forward in their academic career. And it also provides really good feedback for 
the city of Coralville as they consider all of these different design proposals. Yeah. Thanks, Blake. Thank you all for coming again. It's really nice seeing so many people invested in our education and also their community. Our design um, strives to promote this community, and um, but not only just this community, but also reach out to others um, in a larger area. And by doing so, um, we want to create a new identity for the district here in Coralville. By recognizing and using different elements that make this district such a unique, unique and um, diverse location, we just strive to create a place that people from Coralville, Iowa City, and even further from cities like uh, Cedar Rapids to come together, interact, and enjoy all that Coralville has to offer. My name is Marcus. I'm joined by my peers, Kate, Miles, and Elsa. And um, we like to name our design the regional hub. Um, let's see. This was the first, um, oh, our first idea came from the use of the two rail lines um, and using that transit system to promote connections between all these different communities. Um, starting with this first figure, um, you can see um, to reiterate that the two rail lines meet right at this location and is um, both what we call the Crandick rail line and the, um, the Iowa interstate. And so they connect cities like Cedar Rapids all the way to Davenport and even to some smaller cities and Iowa City. So a major driver behind our initial thinking was the existing feasibility study conducted on the Iowa City Cedar Rapids Railway. Uh, with these seven stops here in the region, Coralville was certainly one that was mentioned and studied and we piggybacked off of that idea and really focused in on Coralville as being a, a potential stop along this light rail. So in figure two, you can see just a few of the um, opportunities and dilemmas that are unique to this site. We've gone over them a couple times. Um, the purple indicated there is the um, sites of brownfields or contaminated soil areas. Um, those green circles represent um, the main entries for vehicle and pedestrian circulation into the site. And we see those as opportunities to create um, a vibrant city entrance. Um, and then the two um, red markers next to the rail lines are um, spots that we would like to propose two new stations that can connect all these communities um, to the center central point in the city. And then at the stage of or at the scale of the Coralville, Coralville as a city, we also thought about potential stops outside of our study area. Uh, those sites were determined mainly by their proximity to major residential centers, cultural centers, recreational. And that's how we decided those, uh, those stops. Uh, as you know, uh, Coralville has a flooding issue. So this graphic shows the buildings within the study area boundary that are affected by the 100 and 500 year flood levels. And along with the existing recently implemented flood mitigation measures built by the city of Coralville, critical infrastructure will need to be elevated one foot above the 100 year flood level. And this will meet the FEMA standards and it will, it will have the buildings receive flood insurance. Another dilemma we worked with was certainly the existing uh, flood mitigation engineering controls that are already there. Uh, those two main things being the pump stations highlighted in green, as well as the flood wall highlighted in orange. Here in the bottom left, you can see our strategy for moving the power lines. Um, our design proposes a um, high density um, building, or a few rather, and our plan is to move the power lines towards the um, outer edges of the site and also burying them um, as they get closer to um, some proposed streets. So this will um, mitigate for those, um, those different limitations and whatnot, so. And down here, uh, Marcus mentioned the brownfield er um, earlier. There have been many activities and businesses that have occurred in the Southeast Commercial District before. Um, some of them can, um, causing contaminants and contaminating the site. But you can see right here in the purple the location of the contaminants and our strategy for fixing this 
is creating um, a capping method that will provide a flexible clay layer and then um, adding approximately five feet of fresh soil. Um, this will also help with the flooding issue and raise the building footprints out of the flooding zone. So getting to our design, our underlying design content intent uh, is based on integrating multiple types of transportation, those being vehicular, pedestrian, and what we are proposing to introduce, uh, rail. We've proposed two rail stops, one on either side of 2nd Street, one on the northernmost Crandic Railway, and one on the southernmost uh, Iowa Interstate Railroad. And then once those rail stops were located, we oriented an axis, pre uh, preserving views between stops and then creating a gap in between these building footprints, uh, mainly focused on pedestrian circulation. Um, here's just a schematic diagram for our proposed land use. Um, here you can see that we have um, quite a few different uses, including um, high density residential areas, um, a new hotel we like to propose in the center area, um, different retail, which spans across the site um, and reaches all the main um, vehicle circulation areas, um, and also plenty of green spaces and um, Private areas for people to walk through and interact with all these different areas. And so here is the site plan for our design of the regional hub. And um, right here we have the um, train stop that which we like to call the Iowa Interstate um, Commuter Rail Stop. And then right up here we have the Crandic Light R Rail Stop. And then we have this axis connecting the two that we like to call the um, Agassiz axis. And within this area, there are um, commercial businesses, retail, restaurants, places for people to come hang out. Um, there's water features, um, boardwalks. They all connect and create a nice social gathering space. Um, along the, uh, this axis up here, we also have the Welcome Walkway, which is a risen pedestrian walk that goes over um, First Avenue and Second Street to create a safe, safe pedestrian um, walkway. And then outside of the axis, we actually have a couple other spots. So we have um, Ripple Park, which is right here, and this will provide a nice green space for rec recreational activity, and there's a splash park. And then we have a um, boardwalk and dock area up here that we like to call um, Clear Creek Lookout. And so this is a space that activates the waterfront and maybe you can stop in and get some food from the food trucks and walk out and hang out on the dock. So there's just several opportunities created within this design. Okay, and then so here's the connection between um, the stops. Here's the bird's eye view. Here's the axis and if you look right here, um, you can see again, here's the Iowa Interstate um, commuter rail stop and the Crandic light rail stop. And then here's the welcome walkway. And so that just, the access in the middle is just a very busy, nice place to be. Okay, so this is explaining the Clear Creek Overlook, which features a bunch of activities like fishing and eating food from the food trucks and just strolling because it's a circular boardwalk so you can walk around it. And then we also implemented a pedestrian bridge across Clear Creek. And then this overlook provides 360 views that looks down Clear Creek in both directions and then also up to Biscuit Creek. And then um, this figure 17 shows the boardwalk at a 100 year flood stage. And that also offers different opportunities to use it. And then this is just a section showing there's a bus stop right there, food truck area, and then there's a green space park, and then the overlook. Um, if you're wondering why it's why we called it Agassi Access, it's because we named it after Louis Agassi, and he's the person that named Coralville because he was a Harvard zoologist, and he came and talked at the University of Iowa and talked about the Coralville and the limestone along the Iowa River. So we thought it was good to name him after this access because he was the name that, he was the guy that named Coralville. Um, so this access features a bunch of different activities where you can live, work, and play. Um, okay. 
Uh, so along here we have retail and commercial on the first two levels and then on the top level over here we have convention center and a hotel that overlooks the access where they also have terraces that can look in it and then over here we have residential and then there's a terrace up here that features a restaurant which could like offer opportunities for businesses like Monica's to move in there and have this populated strip and we also elevated the buildings five feet so they are accessible through a series of stairs and ramps. So they are flood insurance protected. Okay. okay. One of the major design goals for this, uh, the regional hub, was to balance the circulation between pedestrian um, transportation and also with um, other various forms of transportation, like the rail line and the vehicles. Um, so this top map here um, highlights all the walkable areas um, for pedestrians to go through. Um, here highlighted is the um, that raised pedestrian walk that connects the two rail stops. And then here you can see that we also reach out um, into the Clear Creek area um, to activate the waterfront. Um, on this lower map, we highlight the vehicle circulation. And so we tried to focus um, all the vehicles onto the two main roads, 2nd Street and 1st Avenue and um, a few small streets that um, move into the site and um, sort of move people to um, these large parking structures to promote um, more walkability and less, um, less parking. Okay, this view shows the, it shows the view to the welcome walkway at night, which is the pedestrian bridge that connects the building so you can cross the intersection safely. And it shows how the site is equipped with safety lighting and aesthetic lighting, so it improves nightlife and people can populate the space throughout all times of the day. Okay. Um, another major design goal for our team was to ensure that um, the business and the culture of this um, district sort of stays and is revitalized. And so to do that, we've um, separated um, this bold urban design into three major phases. Um, this way that this, um, this way the plan is more economically viable and also allows um, chances for um, those businesses already on the site to relocate back into the site once the, um, once the design is complete. Um, so this first one in the top left is the existing building footprints. Um, those are all the existing buildings. Yeah. So there are the existing buildings and the rail lines. And then um, here is our first phase, um, which activates the what we call the central core of the design. Um, it implements the two rail lines and then also the main um, high density buildings of our site and also um, Puts a, um, puts a median into the main streets to sort of help with traffic and just make it a more comfortable um, space. Phase two sort of reaches out into the outer core. Um, and at this point, the, build, um, the businesses and residents from the buildings on site can move into the now implemented um, high density areas. And this also, um, activates a lot of um, new residential areas and retail areas um, for the site. Then lastly, our um, third phase um, implements the raised walkway to promote walkability and safety, and also implements um, all of our waterfront um, elements that create more recreational options for the site. So in terms of metrics, a high percentage of our building density is found in within residential use, although we did not ignore commercial or office space. Uh, the proposed design, as you can see here, wherever it is, shows a tremendous <laughs> a, a tremendous increase in uh, square footage in terms of office office space, commercial space, and with that will bring an increase of jobs, and then. Just to wrap things up, uh, we believe that the regional hub is an ambitious idea. 
uh, that will solidify Coralville within the region in terms of uh, not only transit, but in terms of mixed use development. Thanks for your time. Two minutes for uh, clarification questions. Yeah, I might have missed the rail. How does it get across Second Street? Um, there is an elevated walkway throughout the site that goes within. It'll cross over different streets and then it'll go inside buildings and cross over the Agassi access and then it goes into the welcome walkway and then it'll go into another building and then you can go into the station. So it starts here. So it's a continuous walkway that's inside and outside and it's like a linear element. So the rail is across like the street. It's, it's, it's a rail. Yes. yes. They are two separate rails. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there any way to uh, have those uh, high power line buried underground instead? Um, let's see. We do have a plan to um, put part of it underground, but um, it is quite expensive to um, bury power lines. So we've, um, but possibly with the implementation of this high density area, uh, maybe with time we might be able to implement a design that can bury the power lines completely. You're talking about two separate line also. Mm -hmm. One Just is on the north side of the railroad track. One is cutting across the yeah. second yeah. avenue, I mean, uh, first avenue to the railroad track. Oh, I see. I mean, these here across there, right? Um. Two different ones, yeah. Um, right now our plan is to just um, focus on these um, here that interact with our high density areas, but again, um, possible future development might um, focus on those rail those power lines more. Can you talk a little bit about your increasing density? It looks like you've really increased the density. Do you have, I saw some charts there, do you have a number you can call Um. In terms of, of metrics, it's here at the end. So a full rundown is actually over on our poster just here. It's percentages. But yeah, if you're looking for full rundown on, on statistics, they're over here. It's a huge increase, which is If not right, it's going to be great. OK. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Um, so today we will be presenting a continuous urban district that connects Iowa River Landing and Southeast Commercial District along First Avenue. We are going to outline some of the factors that influence this design and discuss our overall goals, which are to create connectivity, enhance identity, and bring activity to the Coralville community. We will then explain key areas to achieve these goals found throughout the site. I'm Rachel Cross, this is Alyssa Gray and Josh Bergery, and we will be discussing District 1. So the key dilemmas of this site um, are the lack of business that is found along First Avenue corridor, and um, this lack of business is creating a disconnect between Iowa River Landing and Southeast Commercial District. Um, to help accomplish um, this disconnect, we want to create business fronts along First Avenue and create a better indoor-outdoor connection with the business fronts for better pedestrian access as well. So our overall goals for District 1 outlines um, connectivity, identity, and activity. So our first goal today that we're going to be looking at is the connectivity, so we wanted to increase the bicycle use, um, better vehicular connection, and have a better public and pedestrian use. The second is creating a stronger identity um, throughout District 1, which is going to be through using the Iowa River, addressing Clear Creek, um, the culture, and even materiality and art. 
Lastly is the activity of the area. We are wanting to link the community to the Iowa River and the Iowa River Landing, enhance the streetscapes, increase the quality of the Southeast Commercial District altogether. So working off those concepts that Alyssa just uh, spoke about, um, they're very apparent in this plan. Um, so connectivity is achieved uh, by connecting the Southeast Commercial District and the IRL via the First Avenue corridor as well as the Iowa River. Um, and as we do that by improving the vehicular circulation, which First Avenue is under construction as we speak. Um, and we want to improve the pedestrian circulation along First Avenue and as well as along the riverfront. Um, and at a smaller scale, we're uh, proposing internal streets in the Southeast Commercial District and the proposed development along First Avenue to get vehicles off those main roads and into the site um, for ease of access. Um, identity is improved within the area with the sculpture walk that runs along um, the riverfront and into the Southeast Commercial District. And we also have a series of green hubs uh, which move throughout the Southeast Commercial Southeast Commercial District and north to the IRL. Um, and then activity um, is increased just by playing off that of the IRL and trying to bring that activity south along the corridor into the Southeast Commercial District with a variety of building uses that complement that of the IRL. So after seeing that plan, it's important to look at the key factors that influenced our design. Um, so initially, um, the high transmission power lines really influenced our site because we're proposing to keep them in place because um, it is very expensive to move those or bury them. Um, so that divided our site into um, three main sections. And then after that, we imposed the streets in that area because uh, they become very public spaces and are very important for the success of an urban development. And then from there, uh, we established our building footprints from the blocks that we created with those streets and the power line sections. Um, and we pushed and pulled building fronts to create outdoor spaces for users to be, to create comfortable and usable areas. And some other factors that influenced our site um, is the fact that it is a brownfield site. So we're taking into consideration how to address those contaminants. Um, the FEMA regulations, our site uh, will be elevated to uh, accommodate for that. Um, and then placemaking, it's important for us uh, to create a sense of place in the area. And then to activate the Clear Creek as well as the Iowa River it was very important for our team. So to better connect our site, we have introduced three different types of streets. Um, which are called Economic Street, Pedestrian Main Street, and Communal Street. The econom Economic Street is the two streets that are found that are the main arterial streets that go through the site, which are First Avenue and Second Street. Um, these streets are the very busy streets, um, but our main goal for this is to just really enhance it with businesses and create a better pedestrian connection between Iowa River Landing and Southeast Commercial District, as well as um, Iowa City and the rest of the Coralville community. Um, the pedestrian Main Street is found in key areas within our site, which we will show later on. Um, this street is all focused on the pedestrian. Um, this area within our site is very um, highly mixed use, so there is a lot of building fronts um, that the pedestrians can use for entertainment and um, have an area to go for um, activities such as farmers markets, um, outdoor dining, and such. And then communal streets are mainly streets that um, act as access points for pedestrians to use throughout the site, as well as um, streets for vehicular access throughout Southeast Commercial District. Um, this view is the pedestrian main street, and this shows a city market that could be found within this area. And um, the building fronts along this area are uh, mixed use and uh, the bottom first floors are mainly restaurants, retails, and other shops. And then the top um, second floor and above are office space as well as residential use. 
So the second goal that we uh, discussed is identity, and we did this through a series of green hubs. Um, in this diagram, you can see that we have uh, five different ones, um, and the one that we're going to be looking at right now is what we're envisioning as the sculpture walk. We already know that Coralville is trying to implement that throughout, and so we're just wanting to enhance that ability through our green hubs. So each area would host some art that would come from the local artists. The second one that we're going to be discussing is the nightlife that is near Clear Creek. We are proposing for pedestrians that are south of the second street to use the pedestrian bridge that is right here. Um, those are using two rooftop areas. And the one that we're looking at is all the way over here. So we're having this be all pedestrian specifically in this area, and we're hoping to use the restaurants that are here currently to relocate to this side and create a really nice diverse area for people to come to and enjoy. This space is the pedestrian corridor. It really, this space acts as the heart of the Southeast Commercial District, and it shows how leaving that high voltage transition line in place can really act as a benefit to the site. Um, it creates a very active space with mixed use buildings on either side. So there's shops, restaurants, um, and other com commercial uses at the ground floor, and then residential uses on the upper floors. Um, this space not only is an active space, but it also creates the identity with the public art, and it really creates connectivity within the site, but it also brings people in. Um, this parklet at the very front of this image um, is adjacent to Second Street, and it brings people in, that both pedestrians as well as vehicles, because um, there, there's access on either side of that. And then this terrace plaza is at the very southwest corner of the district, and this is also an active space. It brings uh, users from the site, as well as hotel guests out here. It's, it becomes a, a quieter space for them to use. Um, but it also brings people in, uh, both pedestrians and cyclists. Um, and it connects very closely to the university housing that is just south of the site. So it can act as an entry point for them to bring them into the district. And I've talked a lot about bringing people into the district, but why are they coming here? Um, so our, the uses within the site is uh, heavily commercial and residential, with a little bit of office space mixed in as well. Um, so we're bringing people in in that way and creating uh, outdoor spaces for them to occupy um, and enjoy as well. And as you can see, that those uh, gray buildings in there are parking structures, which allow for uh, the mixed-use buildings to be used on the ground floors and doesn't take up extra space for surface parking. <laughs> And how we go about implementing all of this is by using the active street fronts for phase one and constructing the internal streets and buildings that touch these streets, as well as the major arterial streets. In the second phase, we're focusing on completing specific sub areas of the district, which are outlined in the tangerine color. And additional streets within the Southeast Commercial District will allow more buildings and additional parking structures to be built. In the last phase, we are completing it by adding six final buildings. This final phase will also include all of the improvements and additions of the green spaces and the plazas. So in order to create a unique, vibrant, and continuous district for the Coralville community it's, and its visitors, the three goals, connectivity, identity, and activity, creates a continuous district between the Iowa River Landing and the Southeast Commercial District. This redevelopment improves economic and social vitality, not only for the Iowa River Landing and the Southeast Commercial District, but also for the overall community of Coralville and Iowa City. Thank you. There's also an at grade crossing, um, and that is better explained in our plan. So you can see on the building to the right, it's right next to the parklet. Um, so there's surface and above grade. There, there's a single drive that crosses between mm -hmm. the southern part and the northern part of the district, and it, the crosswalk goes along that. I still have a question about the power line. I have a lot of uh, 
this is a, another design, but still did not address uh, or put that into consideration about the cause of it. He said it's expensive. How expensive is it? We're not completely sure about the complete cost that it would take, but with our area not being as high of density as the last group, it would take a longer time possibly to bury those and at a higher cost. Um, this design is definitely looking at a smaller community that might be a little bit more engaged as versus a high density. Um, you have to have the building and the growth and um, you know the businesses to drive that to bring in the money to be able to accomplish that. And so your proposal keeps yes. the transmission line where it is? Yes. Um, maybe in the future if the funding is available and is um, welcomed or if our area does really spark economic growth and the buildings end up becoming larger than what we are proposing, it is a very strong possibility that that can happen. Do you have yes. access to the utility throughout Yes, uh, we've left enough area. We follow the codes of having the clearance uh, for height and width, so it's very accessible for the utility um, people to use them and fix them. You want to try to connect the IRL and the uh, district, which is a great idea. What we have any specific proposals along First Avenue of to do things differently than we're doing them today? Like you say, you know, today we're rebuilding First Avenue and then enhancing sidewalks and those kind of things. Do you have ideas of how we could make that a better pedestrian connection? Do you mean in the, the streetscape itself? Yeah, or, or just, just in general, how how would you how would you enhance what's there today? The connection between IRL and the Southeast. Right, we, I don't, we don't know how in depth the renovation that's going on right now is, uh, but we're just proposing more more vegetation, more uh, street trees, uh, wider sidewalks. I know that this town already has very wide sidewalks. So. Which is greatly appreciated. Yeah. <laughs> it feels really nice just, to walk on. Just really allowing room for vehicle vehicles to travel and the pedestrians to travel mm -hmm. and cyclists to travel without interfering with each other. Mm -hmm. Let me go back to your cross sections and you can point to some of the strategies so here's one of them. Rachel, would you like to talk about this? Yeah, so this section is addressing more about the FEMA regulations, but this could also be an amenity that you could choose to do along First Avenue. But we um, thought it would be a great opportunity to have um, different elevations so that the pe pedestrian felt more at ease going along such a busy road. Um, they would be at a higher level than the traffic would be, so they would feel more away from the vehicle in essence. Okay. <laughs> Thank, Thank you guys. You. All right, how's everyone doing tonight? <laughs> doing good. Good. <laughs> We'll jump right in here. Um, so in this presentation, we will discuss the strategies, frameworks, and design intentions uh, that we relied upon to create a vibrant, more unified, and connected Coralville Southeast Community, Southeast Commercial District for Coralville. Uh, my name's Logan. This is Danny, Mac, and Spencer. So for the industrial greenway concept, we really wanted to utilize existing infrastructure um, and site elements such as, such as the high voltage transmission lines um, and other linear spatial organizations that currently exist in the site and dissect them. Um, and again, we just want to do this to create a more unified, cohesive district for Coralville. So similar to the previous group, uh, they chose to retain the exi existing power lines. We want to do the same, but we're going to do it in a way that is very artistic and highly articulated to create more of an enjoyable experience along um, these power lines. Um, like Logan said, uh, three of the main considerations we had for this project were the existing rail lines, the power lines, and the brownfields that were existing there. So uh, the main design opportunities that we derived were from the north and south rail lines on the site um, because we noted the proximity to existing trails and also after noting the uh, feasibility study, we thought that uh, the connection with the existing site prove that it was a good place and opportunity to expand on this area, uh, to ex establish transit centers, to further connect the area to the Iowa River Landing, Iowa City, and the surrounding region. Uh, with the power lines, they are a very visual and physical component of the site, and they divide it 
um, physically and limit the building opportunities underneath and next to it. Uh, so we decided to bury the lines along First Street, but preserve and enhance the ones that go across, or yeah, go across Second Street uh, to uh, help define urban form and providing a usable and appealing space for both residents and visitors of the site. Um, finally, with um, one of the last considerations we had for the site with the brownfields, we knew that remediation would be necessary, which we approached through capping like the first group, uh, remediation through um, vegetation if necessary, and filling with new soil. Um, we also saw them as uh, reputation, uh, representations of the past history of autom automobile driven um, industry of the site. Um, so we really wanted to emphasize um, this with material choices and acknowledging the existing history of the site to create um, an important connection to the existing identity while also um, creating new vitality um, to the site. So like Danny was saying, our design intention was to use some of the existing frameworks, primarily the rails and the power lines, to organize the site. And so from using this uh, diagonal line of the power lines, we based a 90 degree grid off of those to organize a lot of the other site elements. And a linear greenway was designed underneath the power lines to highlight them and unify the site across Second Street. And additional site elements were based off of this greenway to add emphasis to it, to celebrate the urban form and the urban context that the site is in instead of trying to hide it. So we chose to focus on seven major design elements and site, current site conditions whenever we were um, developing the spatial arrangement of this plan. And those can be seen on the left side of your screen there. So obviously the rail line is very important to the residents of Coralville. Um, and as you can see, I don't have the laser pointer, but in the upper right corner and the lower left hand corner, there are two proposed rail stations. Um, the rails stay in their current configuration, but the linear axis pr um, proposed by the park there in the middle of the plan, that connects the two, the two rail lines. The second is roads. We tried to retain the existing roadways as much as possible, but we did add two roads in the northern portion of the site and one that dissects the site in the lower portion. Um, again, the trails stayed relatively the same. Sidewalks, as mentioned previously, they're in decent shape currently. They're plenty wide, um, but we did add sidewalks around all of the new proposed structures. Um, plazas, this is a big one. So we wanted to incorporate a lot of green space as well as have a relatively high density within the site. So in order to incorporate that, we chose to incorporate this long linear park in addition to the power park, which is the triangular shaped park in the central of the site. Um, and that brings us in, into the buildings themselves. So as mentioned before, the density was a, a big problem we wanted to address, but also we wanted to keep it relatively mixed use. So as you can see, each of those structures with a P on the roof, those are parking structures, so we have plenty of parking, but we also have several different um, varieties of uses. So we have mixed use apartments surrounding the largest parking structure there with a courtyard in the middle. Um, we have offices along the boundaries of the sites, and then we have a row, two rows of townhouses in the left-hand portion of the site. Um, and those townhouses actually face the linear park itself, and those are just a nice amenity for the people that live there. So we have a good mix of affordable housing um, and things like that. So as our group believes, public transportation is very important to a community um, and just allowing people to get around. And so we focused on uh, implementing a light rail trail, uh, a light rail, just as some of the other groups have, which is outlined in the blue dashed line. And so this light rail is going to start at Iowa City and have several stops along the way at the university, and then a major stop in the Southeast Commercial District where we've proposed a transit hub, which would be like a large um, transit station where you can buy tickets, park your car, get out and catch a bus or a taxi. Um, and then if you don't wanna stop at the transit station, you can go up and stop at IRL or all the way up to the mall. And then the dashed line that's in yellow is the regional trail, or the regional train, which we proposed a smaller train station on the site in the southwest corner, which Logan said is connected by our linear park. Okay, um, 
So as this design was being developed, we not only wanted to create a unique identity for the area, but also pay homage to the site's history. Uh, so by preserving the power lines, the design helps to keep a part of the site's existing infrastructure and um, also a remnant of its movement towards urban form. And by adding to it with existing materials, we propose like um, core 10 steel uh, throughout the area, just more steel, brick, and limestone that would connect it physically and um, aesthetically to the existing Coralville site. Uh, we wanted to um, connect it to the industrial past um, to share a visual connection to the rest of the area. Uh, for the power lines, we proposed a kind of steel cage that would be um, uplit with different colors that could be changed throughout the year. That would be kind of a more whimsical and um, enticing amenity to the park that would help create a um, unique identity for this green space that we proposed. Um, also throughout the area, we wanted to pay attention to the diverse population and representation through different art and murals that would also aid with local businesses in the area. And so overall, the design would be a balanced combination of existing identity and also new um, different aspects with this new proposed park that would focus idea, um, businesses to the area. Uh, so on this section, you can see Second Street going through here. Um, we adjust the elevation change through small retaining walls that could act as seating. We have the upper part, which is the Clear Creek Park, moving down to the middle area of the power park. Um, and you can see uh, the power lines being lit up. So pretty safe and attractive feature for the area. So like Danny was saying, for the identity of the site. We really wanted to make this an experience as well for pedestrians and just make it more enjoyable to be on the site and include lots of programmed activities for people to have. So in addition to catching transit and things like that, you can come and shop, dine, socialize in the Coral Court, which is up on the, the top image. Uh, you can walk your dog in the Greenway. You can jog on the Clear Creek trails. You can view art installations on the power lines and those lighting elements. You can catch a light rail down to a game in, at the university or go all the way to Iowa City. You can fish in Clear Creek. You can enjoy an outdoor movie like they're doing in that uh, image as well. Kayak on Iowa River, Clear Creek. Uh, watch the sunset on Clear Creek Plaza or grab a meal from a food truck by the transit hub. And so we wanted to, uh, what this design is doing is bringing people into the area and making it a destination instead of somewhere to just to pass through. So part of, uh, a big part of our greenway design is these braided pathways. So there's essentially a series of three paths that go throughout the green space. And they um, connect you, like as you're walking along the paths, they connect you to houses, businesses, uh, restaurants, and parks. And so you get a good mix of things on your walk. Um, and what's really great about them is that they create lots of little subspaces of green space, which are great for using different plantings for bioremediation for the contamination or for putting up art installations or just having a lot of flexible smaller spaces to put in little park areas. And then what the braid also does is since it's cut, the greenway is cut by these roads, um, Second Street and our proposed road, it kind of brings a continuity through the green space since it's just a uh, continuous flowing lines. And it also offsets the power lines and some of the buildings nearby. As community members of Coralville, you guys are all well aware of the history and, and damage that flooding has caused uh, within the community. So we all know that there's a pump system and flood walls that should prevent any further flooding of the site. Um, but we want to do, we feel we can do more with that. So in the industrial greenway plan, all proposed building elevations are one foot above the 500 year flood level. So as you can see in the top left diagram, that is the existing, in its current state, the existing conditions um, for the 100 and 500 year floodplain. The second metric, or the second diagram, shows the same, it's the same area, same site boundary, but that just shows everything, all the building elevations are one foot above the 500 year floodplain. And again, the section does a good job of illustrating at the 100 year and 500 year flood levels and how that relationship between the buildings and the water level uh, as portrayed in our design. So with metrics, um, our plan with the metrics is to increase the amount of mixed use space, as you can see, the yellow and the red, the red being retail and service and the yellow being residential areas. 
and we've packed a lot of new, uh, a, not a, a lot of new dwelling units into the site to bring in a lot of residents, and also increasing the green space compared to the the open space or the building footprints. That way, we can have a really dense area that businesses can come to, and that will really instigate a lot of change and initiate rail development on both of the rail lines. And quickly through the phasing, um, just focusing on how existing businesses and people will move around. We wanted to establish the local uh, rail line first on the northeast corner of the site um, and then move in businesses to that area while the rest of the site is being remediated throughout the other phases. And finally, um, continuing that greenway through the lower part as the phases continue on uh, to help bring more development into that area as uh, the site is being developed. So all in all, our design focuses on preserving the existing frameworks, namely, namely the Crandic rail line corridor and the power lines, and create, or turning them into assets. And the design brings people together by giving them just a place to live, work, eat, and relax. Thank you. Are there any questions? We've got about two minutes for questions. major fashion with your proposal? So the interaction that we proposed was shown, I think, here mostly. There's plazas on the back side of some of the developments. I think, well, I think it's kind of dead. But uh, on the back side of these developments here, okay. to interact with Click Creek Plaza and so shown here also on this section and stuff like that. So. It would be um, this line in blue right here. Um, the top first, left this image. Line. Yeah, on First Street. Oh. Those would be the ones we'd bury, um, ideally in the original spot, and then keeping the and ones that are going across. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay, thank you guys. Oops. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shelby Cook, and these are my partners, Julie Benishek and Scott Randall. And our design, Horizontal Flows, focuses on opportunities in the site to activate Clear Creek and unify the north and south sides of the southeast commercial district across 2nd Street. Um, we address pedestrian flows, traffic concerns, and connectivity across the site to help the district become a place for the community. First, we're going to start off by talking about the eight influential conditions and how we address them. And then we will talk about three design strategies that we came up with, as well as going into the master plan and vision. And then we'll go into more design detail from there. So to begin, I want to quickly highlight how our final design concept addresses the eight influential elements. So first is Second Street. Our design would make that area a more walkable space by increasing the crossings from one to three. With the waterfront, um, we would make Clear Creek more activated by adding a new pedestrian path, bridge, plazas, and then connecting those back to the existing pedestrian trails. Um, for the next one, we would organize the structured new development um, and define the exterior spaces more than existing. For the power lines, we would take the main diagonal power line and place it underground in the same location to cut down on cost, open up more room for mixed use development, um, and to find a new view corridor. Continuing with the FEMA compliance, we would raise the site five feet in elevation to bring it out of the 100 year plus one foot um, elevation requirement. As well as for the brownfield contamination, we would use a capping strategy and provide a buffer between residents um, and the contaminated spots by making the new mixed use development first floor, commercial, and parking only. Um, for placemaking, we would add more iconic structures on the eastern uh, edge of the site near the existing uh, limestone boulders, just making it a more prominent gateway area. 
And then for the rail, our design is not contingent on developing a rail transit system. However, it provides flexibility and room for growth if it were design or developed in the future, um, which we kind of indicate by adding a extended wing that meets from a proposed skywalk to the developed transit, as well as providing space for um, a depot up in the northeast corner. So in addition to the eight factors that Julie just went over, we had three primary observations that informed our design strategies. The first was that Second Street is very vehicle dominated, which is natural for a highway, but we believe that there is potential for more pedestrian use in the area. Second was that Clear Creek is somewhat isolated by the current arrangement of buildings. There is connection, but we believe that there can be more connection and more integration into the rest of the site. And then finally, we noticed that these retention ponds that you see in this third, um, this third image create kind of an access or a view corridor that we wanted to highlight moving forward in our design. And so moving forward with those three uh, findings, we strive to make Second Street more walkable by adding more crossings, to activate uh, Clear Creek and reconnect it to the Coralville community, as well as um, really capitalize on the view back to the historic structures significant to Coralville. And our overall uh, goal for this design was to make the district a more safe, walkable, and unified area for the Coralville community to enjoy. So going into our master plan design, overall we added larger, more dense, organized building masses that help to unify the site. We have more green spaces present, as well as we have consolidated parking, which can be seen throughout the site. Um, going along with how we're improving Second Street, we're pr trying to preserve trees along Second Street as much as possible on the edges. We are terracing up to the buildings and bringing them closer to the street front to help activate the storefronts. We are adding a new median that goes down the center to help make it more safer for traffic. And we're adding a new intersection at the West End. Uh, looking at the creek, there's a new trail that we're proposing along the northern edge of the site that helps to connect to the other side of the creek, of the creek trail, which is connected by a pedestrian bridge here. Uh, there are also terracing decks here and here, which go down to the waterfront to allow people to get closer to the water. And then there will also be space for decks, recreation, and row housing. And looking at how we're reinforcing the view, we have Clear Creek, Clear, Clear Creek Plaza right next to Clear Creek, a skywalk that connects over here to Central Plaza as well. Our strategy for transforming Second Street revolved around three main um, uh, intentions, which the first would be to create a more uh, unified atmosphere along Second Street, to make it not just a place where cars drive through, but a place for people to walk and to actually spend time. Second was to meet the FEMA requirements by elevating the buildings to an appropriate height. And then finally, to make it a comfortable place for pedestrians to provide seating and amenities. And so we, to in order, in order to create that defined volumetric space, we have uh, some of our taller mixed use buildings closely aligned with Second Street to meet the FEMA regulations in a relatively short space from the road to the buildings. We have a sidewalk and then it's terraced up and so there's about 10 feet of sidewalk and then a wider terrace up close to provide places for the storefronts to add outdoor seating for restaurants and then it also would provide space for seating, shade structures, and places for people to sit, to rest, and to socialize. So taking a closer look at our creek strategy and how it helps to create a new identity for the downtown district, um, you can see that there are, in, the, in this image, there are spaces for gathering, recreation, and observation. Uh, the path goes right next to the flood wall, and then the terracing happens over the flood wall, so there is no inter interference with that. Um, it helps to connect back to the creek, create a new identity. There are several piers that exist on the site. As you can see here, there's a pedestrian bridge with little pier lookouts, and then there's terracing that goes down to the water here and terracing that goes down to the water in the background. And then this, there's also space for vendors to interact as well as for the business fronts to get closer to the creek. And in this section, you can see how the 100-year FEMA compliance is incorporated into the creek plaza. 
Our view strategy stems from the lack of views that penetrate into the site, as well as the potential to connect with the two historic uh, buildings significant to Coralville. The view corridor that we propose in our design connects between the historic schoolhouse and town hall, um, and then it runs diagonally and connects to a proposed central plaza. So this view corridor is supposed to help organize the site, and it links to important plazas and exterior spaces that we propose across the site. Um, it also is strengthened by numerous elements like the pergola, um, the change in paving material that runs the width of the view corridor, and then trees that line the path and help frame that view. Okay, so these images show our concept for our primary green space, which is a large plaza in the center of the site. As you can see, it's surrounded on three sides by buildings. So at ground level, these would feature uh, mostly shops, places for people to come in to shop to spend time. And then in the center of the plaza, we wanted it to be high capacity and flexible. And so it would provide a lot of um, different amenities to facilitate different activities. So things like a stage for performances and then adjacent to that, a lawn space that could be used for people to go and play Frisbee. And then during concerts, people could sit there and watch the performance. And then it also includes a linear water feature, a place for children to play. And then adjacent to that, a play structure. And there is also plenty of seating and shade. The Skywalk also helps with the view. Um, it connects to buildings on both sides of 2nd Street, and the ends align with that diagonal corridor, just helping people to move and look in the direction of that view. Um, it provides unique aerial views that sweep the site um, and has easy access with elevators at key corners of the buildings. Um, so it really fosters these unique views as well as provides another safe crossing for the pedestrians across 2nd Street without um, interrupting that flow of traffic. Taking a closer look at Clear Creek Plaza, you can see how it helps to reinforce the view. It becomes a landing point for people. It strengthens the connection to Clear Creek. It terraces down to the water's edge. Um, and as you can see in the design here, there are rows of trees, space for seating, uh, there's space for vendors. And all in all, it just really helps to activate the creek front. This is an overview of some of the metrics for our plan. As you can see, there's quite a bit of information, but I just wanted to briefly highlight down in this corner right here. This is our, these are the percentages for land use. So as you can see, we have about 32% for housing, 20% for commercial, 25% for office space, 23% for parking. And then that includes, um, Total on the site, about 53% of open space. And then over here, we have our phasing plan. Our intent with this is to start with gradual implementation. And so this right here constitutes the first phase. This would provide places for existing buildings, or sorry, existing businesses to move before the redevelopment of their site. And then in the second phase, this is where the first residential use begins to come in. This would allow a residential building right here. This would give the, play, the residents already living on site somewhere to go before that's redeveloped. And then the third phase would fill out the rest of the development. So overall, our design unifies and connects the Southeast Commercial District back to Corville by making 2nd Street more walkable, engaging the creek, and orienting the site towards historic views. Thank you. We have two minutes for questions. I'm just wondering about Second Street. Will this, well, Second Street be as wide as it is now, or with the center, down the center, was that discussed at all? Yeah, the length, the width of the um, lanes of the road would stay the same, and the median would go where the turn lanes are currently existing on the site. A uh, question about a comment. I like I like your uh, way you uh, address Clear Creek, and then the, the, the view line uh, down Clear Creek and, and Biscuit Creek. I think is is interesting. I like that a lot. <laughs> okay. Thanks, guys.
negotiating boundaries, which is also a design concept for the Southeast Commercial District. So, in the following presentation, we will first guide you through our design concept, which is the negotiating boundaries, and then to our general design framework, finally to our detailed design proposal. So, first, we will talk about what is our concept and where it comes from. And we clearly understand the great potential of Southeast Commercial District as an important gateway between Korea and the University of Iowa by interpreting the whole district as an entity that is wrapped by the hard boundaries, and which comprise of the tangible elements like water, trail, rail weight, and the soft boundaries, which comprise intangible, subtle elements like industrial history and materiality. All these elements present a sense of boundaries. By negotiating this boundary, which we implied completing and enhanced the existing condition of all these elements, we try to revitalize and increase the district identity. So next, what we will talk about how we're going to negotiate these boundaries in a conceptual level. First, we will need to define the problem existing in the soft and hard boundaries. Then we will apply the distort, overlap, and reverse strategy to enhance their conditions to achieve the overall improvement. So the strategy one defined. We analyze the urban fabric and find out there are too much impermeable paving areas right now, and we need to reduce that. We find out the material like limestone, brick, and cordon steel can represent the in industrial history, and we should run away them. And find out existing landscape is nice and valuable, and we need to reserve them. So strategy two, this tour. We find out some places is now lacking of connectivity. So we want, so we modify the mobility network and create entries for vehicular and pedestrians. Flooding has always been an issue right now. So we expand the water line in this weak point and we extend the protected earth burn to mitigate the flooding. So strategy three, overlap. We analyze the existing structure, assets, and landscape and infer where are the appropriate places for activities to happen. We define the important catalyst size and assign them the appropriate building type and uses. So strategy four, revert, reserve. And we analyze the surrounding context and bring them into the design consideration. Find out the disconnectivity and add in pedestrian and vehicular access to complete the mobility network. So this slide just shows how we to go, went through the design and thinking process in a conceptual level. It serves as our guideline and methodologies for developing the actual design strategies. Now let's look at this diagram as application of the conceptual strategy into the actual design. First, we relocate the transmission poles and reserve the unique materiality to match the parcel layout and to enhance the polympsite boundary that represent the industrial path of the district. Second, we consider the variety of different types of open space, including pocket plaza, rooftop and terrace garden, and public green space to make sure that will attract different type of users. Third, we enhance and preserve the existing streetscape and create a green corridor that will connect from district to district and destination to destinations. Fourth, we create two deep, two public green spaces that function as large-scale green infrastructure to soften the environmental issues such as flooding, protect the water quality, and create habitat morphology. Fifth, we are applying capping and capping plus remediation in the contaminated site to ensure a quality redevelopment for the brownfield. Sixth, we envision the future use of the interstate rail in two scenarios. One is the rail will turn into a passenger rail, which will feature with overlook platform, allowing flexible redevelopment. Second, a tunnel under the rail to direct the water to the large scale green infrastructure and allow continuous circulation. Here, uh, with the methodology and design framework, we outline our master plan with highlight of four catalyst sites. First, mixed use prioritizing commercials, located within the First Avenue and Second Street intersection. It carries high volume of traffic. Second, mixed use prioritizing residential and retails. It is near the waterfront. Within the new development of waterfront, this area will have great potential become a place for work, play, and stay. Mixed use, third, mixed use prioritizing service and local retails. 
with the understanding of how valuable the local business and their co contribution to a district's identity and culture. This area near 2nd Street, we envision it become not only an extension of the corridor of commercial from the west, but also a new culture and social hub within the district. Fourth, mixed use prioritizing innovative industrial and business. We envision the new development will have a need to bring a broader range of business and industrial. From the west to east, we anticipate from high tech industrial to traditional light industrial. With the cotton steel transmission ports, we are trying to represent a historical corridor which link from the future to the present and to the past. Here is the uh, land use plan for South East Commercial District. We envision the corridor will trans transition from formal industrial use to compact and mixed use development. This strategy will create a vibrant community by proposing an active, active and transparent ground level to attract pedestrians, increase the amount of ground level retail to activate the street. We propose more than eight diverse use within walking distance to achieve work, play, and stay. Propose 30 dwelling units per acre with high density residential development to support a variety of housing needs, such as service apartment, apartment, family studio, and affordable housing. As we are trying to create a pedestrian-friendly community and we understand how important open space is to nurture a healthy community. So we create a variety of civic and green space within the district to contribute to the comfort and pedestrian safety. If allowed, it, treat an interval of 25 feet along both sides of the street to secure the healthy growth of the trees and provide, provide shade. 100% of the dwelling units and non-residential users have access to civic and green space within a walking distance. Implementing traffic coming strategy if allowed it, to secure pedestrian safety and provide more pedestrian crosswalk, encourage the walking. So as we, as we understand how a good public space can activate its surrounding and attract more investment, we will then dive into the detailed design proposal for the two major public space that we propose. The first one is the, it's about the waterfront design, which we named it the riparian public space. To activate the waterfront, we feature with the following programming. The habitat morphology, which is adapted from the coral geology, the limestone, and we interpreted it into a flooding mitigation structures that allows for seeding rehabilitations for other creatures and improve the water quality and providing some sort of ecosystem services. Limestone palaces, interreactive edge to provide waterfront access, protected burn for flood attenuation, splash fountain as an interest, pedestrian bridge to connect the north and south side. Landscape notes to overlook the whole waterfront. Talking about the specific strategy for flooding attenuation, we propose double, rail, double trail system. One trail allows close waterfront access while it's floodable. The other trail is beyond the flood plan, will allow for 24 and 7 hours access to waterfront. In between them, the protective burn is planted with water tolerate native vegetation and series of treatment to purify the surface water before it enters to the creek. In addition, the splash fountain will serve as a demonstration of the rainwater treatment in both rain and snow events. The Industrial Heritage Park, which we name is Rusty Red, is, it, it is located between the residential waterfront and the university. The existing environmental context uh, make it a great opportunity for this site to become a social and green infrastructure. Uh, with place making, cultural making, and material making. We propose reuse materiality to create different types of plaza and retention styles. And we propose a tunnel underneath the rail to direct the water to the large scale green infrastructure and to allowing, uh, allowing pedestrians to walk on the boardwalk to get, to get more experience. So overall, this is the big picture we outline for the future of Southeast Commercial District with the compact and misused development, riparian public space, heritage park, and others. We hope to cre create a vibrant, vivid community with strive economy, active social atmosphere, and healthy environment. 
Thank you for listening, and we are now open to feedback and questions. Thank you. It is a. Uh, it, it has a. Uh, the first. It is located on the previous uh, scrapyard. scrapeyard. So uh, it's like a, as a contaminated site. We are trying to like make it. Uh, it's like a temporary park. So we do capping and have like soil, mm -hmm. so you can allow the photo uh, phyto remediation once it gets like completely like remediate, or you can still keep it or having a new development in this area. If like we envision more like high density development, so it might turn into like development in the future. Yes, and above it is residential and it is mm -hmm. office space over here. And here will be the water, water from the assets. So the, uh, it has a great opportunity to uh, filter the water before it enters to the creek and provide the social activity for both the housing and for both, uh, for both housing and office space. Thank you, Sienaki. Thank you. All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks for sticking around for so long. We appreciate it. We only have two more left, and then we can all caravan over the brewery. So uh, my name's Harrison, this is Connor, and this is Caleb. Um, so for this presentation, we're going to outline as first, I'm going to talk about our uh, overall concept. Uh, then we're going to go into some of the on site conditions that backed up that concept or influenced it. Um, talk about how we're going to phase out our uh, design proposal, and then we'll show you the overall design proposal, and then highlight some key features in that design. Um, so when we first uh, got back from our site visit, we noticed that there were um, a few key things that were preventing the site from becoming um, at this high-density new urban core um, that we're envisioning it to be. The biggest one was that there's a, a disconnect on 2nd Street, or uh, along the Strip. Um, and without connecting that area, it's going to be very difficult to create that urban core that we're talking about. That among a few other things that we'll get into in just a minute. Um, but that influenced our, our overall design of that we need to connect the two sites or connect the strip. Um, so strip zipper is our concept. So to begin with, um, like Harrison said, there are a few key issues um, that prevented us from reaching the site's future potential. So we wanted to create a high density mixed use urban center, urban core. And those three dilemmas were the existing impermeable surfaces and the um, disconnect fragmented buildings that seem to be a little disorganized. And the second one is the existing circulation on site. There are some dead ends between both pedestrian circulation and streets on site. And then the existing green space is lacking, so there is some along um, 2nd Street and then along the uh, waterfront of Clare Creek. And then our solutions to these dilemmas that we found were creating a new, um, more urban, um, urban form that connects both sides of 2nd Street. And then the second one was creating more circulation paths for pedestrians, streets that um, go through the entire site, and then also adding a transit station um, with a rail line stop at the southeast corner. And then to address the lack of green space, we tried to balance out the hardscape and the green space on site and um, through more creek activation and this zip way down the middle. Okay, so another thing that may have been a dilemma is the brownfield um, and the presence of contaminants within the site. Um, but we also saw this kind of as an opportunity because that's basically why we're here, as through the efforts of TAB and organizations like that, um, there's more funding available and things like that. So um, also, it was just something we had to consider throughout our design. We had to make sure that we didn't place buildings in contaminated areas. 
So uh, we used different strategies like capping certain areas that were severely contaminated and then also um, implementations of bioswale similar to this strategy you can see here that has a liner at the bottom to permit anything from filtering down into the groundwater through contaminated soil and also horizontal walls to prevent anything from migrating um, horizontally throughout the site. Um, so I talked a little bit about our overall design, or overall concept earlier, but to back that up, we generated five ov overarching goals that um, uh, uh, governed how we laid out our design. So um, starting with mixed-use development, we wanted to incorporate mixed-use because it gives us a lot of flexibility about where we put um, commercial, where we put residential, and that makes sure that no area of the site is um, uh, dead at certain times of the day. So you don't have areas that are just active from 9 to 5. You don't have areas that are just active at lunchtime. Um, mixed, mixed use makes it so that they're active all the time. And to reinforce that mixed use development, we, we want to activate the streetscape, especially around 2nd Street, um, so that when people, usually right now, people are going to just fly through. Um, but with an activated streetscape, they might be able to look off to the side and see something that they want to learn more about or want to go experience, so they pull off and actually get to go to the site. Um, along with that streetscape, we need green infrastructure to make sure that um, everything is clean and that we're um, handling pollutants and everything um, in a clean way, just like Caleb was talking about with those brown fields. Along with green infrastructure, we really want to restore Clear Creek. Uh, the reason being is that waterfront developments are uh, one of the most proven ways to put development in an area, and we really want to use Clear Creek um, as a waterfront activation area to once again reinforce that mixed-use development. Um, so to back up these goals and accomplish our goal of zipping the strip, we started with this zipway, which is this green wedge that runs from the top of Biscuit Creek, or the bottom of Biscuit Creek, down to the southeast corner where it reaches the transit hub. And this transit hub, um, we propose a new rail line stop right here along the back side, so activating this corner. And then moving north of that, we have our commercial core, which is a layering of many commercial um, areas as well as restaurants and then it's partially covered an outdoor space on the inside and then with this commercial core that activates this streetscape along this side right here which is what Harrison was talking about um, and then also activating across the street through this skywalk um, allowing pedestrian access over the site and activating the street si street streetscape on the north side of 2nd Street with more office buildings and commercial on that side. And then the skywalk reaches all the way out to Clear Creek and connects to the boardwalk that activates that waterfront that we are wanting to um, be a part of our design. All right, and so you can see from the phasing strategy um, that we start out here with the existing building footprint and we first concentrate on the lower portion of the site um, and clearing that area of the brownfield because we've found that it's probably the most severely contaminated and then um, building new buildings there would give an opportunity for other buildings in the next phase to move there as you can see with the arrows and then um, we would build on the north side of 2nd Avenue and then move from there into the central part of the site to build up residential and more commercial uses as, as well as the transit stop. And then we would build our final buildings in phase four. And then at the very end, we would implement our pedestrian walkways and things like that uh, throughout to create more placemaking within the district. And these are really important to us, these phases, because they're the best way we could find to make sure that people within the community were not displaced during the different phases of our design. And they also really just make sure that there is a gradual build towards the density because we are proposing a really high uh, density development and it probably is not gonna happen overnight. So we wanna make sure that the has time to gain popularity as we build it up. Um, here's our metrics and um, I think the first thing you can see from this is that it really is a mixed-use development. Um, there's different 
buildings and different uses all throughout the district. Um, the second thing that you can see is that we do try and line most of the frontages with commercial on the first floor. Um, and we do this for a couple of reasons. One, we want to create continuity throughout the district so that it seems like you're in a place that is made for people to be walking around. And it does create a connection across Second Street, which is one of our main goals. And also because one of the determinants of walkability is that there's several destinations throughout the uh, places for you to be so that you're interested constantly seeing opportunities for you to enter a store or for you to go to a shop or something of that nature. Um, also, um, you can see that we decided to space out our parking garages throughout so that uh, we don't have a central parking garage for each building, but rather bigger parking garages that serve the blocks themselves. So moving on to transportation, um, like we said, we have this transit, cup, transit hub in the southeast corner of the site. Um, and we, we decided this transit hub was important because if we're bringing people and businesses into the site, we want um, adequate public transportation. So inside the transit hub, we have the platform on the back side, which you can see in this um, perspective. Um, and then inside is many layers of commercial. So while people are waiting for their train, they can um, get something to eat or shop around. And then at the top of the transit hub, we have this rooftop lounge, which is uh, delineates the end of the zipway and creates a really nice view over the um, green the zipway. Um, and then we also implemented vehicular transportation, so adding in more streets and making them connect a little bit better than they are currently, and. Um, adding in more pedestrian access. So once people enter the site, they can um, kind of get wherever they're going whenever they need to uh, easily and efficiently. And social gathering spaces were an important part of our design. So to, in order to encourage development, we wanted to create a place where people wanted to be. And um, creating a variety of social gathering spaces was um, something that would help that. So we have the Zipway, which features um, an amphitheater, a open lawn, playground, and some outdoor dining plaza spaces. And adjacent to that is our core, which can, uh, as you can see, has many layers of um, commercial as well as can host community events, um, game day um, viewing parties, I guess, and performance spaces, and um, can also function as a concert venue. All right, so earlier I talked about how waterfront developments were one of the best way to bring in development into a site. And so we really made developing and restoring uh, the Clear Creek waterfront a, a prominent goal in our design. So we did that by providing multiple different amenities to get people down to the water, such as this boardwalk that sits just behind the flood wall, as well as some platforms that push down into it and a water feature at the end of this perspective. We also restored it by putting riprap just along the front of the, fr uh, uh, just along the, front of the flood wall because no plants would grow there, and then gradually have that fade away to riparian species as you get um, towards the creek. Um, but when we were adjusting that flood wall, we wanted to make sure that we kept the integrity of, um, uh, of what that actually did for the site. And so these two diagrams show what our proposal would do to um, the flooding situations. And the top proposal is for a 100-year flood event. You can see that that flood wall still protects um, the full site from a flood. And this bottom one is um, of a storm event that's even greater than 500 years occurrence. And you can see that all developments are still protected. And they're all on terraces that lead um, up to the developments. And then that diagram shows how the zipway um, filters out or collects stormwater, moves it away from the development, and back into Clear Creek. So currently, Second Street creates division within the site, acting as a barrier to pedestrian circulation, while at the same time encouraging motorists to speed through without paying attention to the district. But our design solves this issue through the implementation of a mixed-use development with points of interest on both sides of Second Street that are connected by a new and improved circulation system, and also line Second Street with building frontages to catch the attention of any passersby. These efforts will zip the strip together and pro provide a dynamic core for Coralville. Thank you for your time.
Did yeah. you mention, and maybe you didn't, I just didn't hear it, uh, how are you going to address the power line? Oh, yeah. It's in, actually, the first phase of our phasing. Um, you can kind of see it's in orange. Um, so it's a thin line, but we're going to have them come through here and move them and then come along here and then connect back to the original at these two points. So we're basically just moving them overhead, yeah. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you guys. Hello. Thank you all for coming out to, tonight to hear about our design proposals for the Southeast Commercial District. You have heard our classmates present their proposals, and we hope to keep you alert for just one more. <laughs> our project is called Building Up, and our focus is building up community, building up economy, and building up terrain. My name is Morgan. With me is Bridget, Grace, and Madison. Through this presentation, we'll be delivering our, delivering our key dilemmas and corresponding strategic responses, followed by our, our site design. We will then present how we will address community, economy, and terrain within our proposal. We will then present how we will um, plan on implementation of the design through a series of phases and what the land use breakdown will be. At the end of the presentation, we'll be open to any questions you may have. So let's begin. As we began to examine the site, a series of key dilemmas emerged for us. These dilemmas included circulation, or lack of, adequate open space, especially along the creek front, and spatial organization. To resolve these dilemmas, we looked at how pedestrian and vehicular circulation interacted, was integrated into a complete system, and would be safe for all users. After developing a circulation pattern, we designed open space that would support the circulation pattern, as well as influence the culture and identity of the site. Finally, spatial organization. This dilemma was solved in junction with circulation and open space and strengthened by building performance. The buildings on the site serve three different roles. The core area activates and encourages experiences. The buildings surrounding the core wrap and enclose this area. And the edge supports and frames the district while serving as a transition space to the surrounding neighbors. Okay, so the new development works to build up the community, economy, and terrain throughout the district. Um, the community is built up through the integration of mixed income housing with public transportation options, neighborhood events, and a connection to the greater Coralville area through a citywide trail system. Economy is built up <clears throat> as businesses of all ages, shapes, and sizes bring together the mixed use district. Incubator companies have space alongside successful businesses, and while restaurants and cafes sit near small town boutiques and chain pharmacies. Businesses and tenants on the existing site will have the option to be grandfathered into the new development, ensuring that they have a great location without worrying about a sudden hike in rental costs. And lastly, in order to ensure maximum protection against the future flooding, um, the terrain across the site is built up just like all the other teams, raising all the proposed buildings a foot above the 100-year flood time <laughs> and limiting the fear of flood damage in the future. Okay, so the site offers multiple pedestrian and vehicular entry points, but the primary route is along this new boulevard um, it's right here. I don't know if that works. Okay. So Market Boulevard connects to smaller streets on the site and allows for easier vehicular circulation to and from businesses and public spaces. As Morgan mentioned, um, building masses on the site serve um, one of three spatial purposes and the central core is used to activate the district. This core becomes the primary driver of organization and is broken into four smaller blocks. The first section contains a performance line and a flexible event space. Its location near parking and close to the community trail allows for easy access at all times of day and times of year. The second and third sections are divided by a pedestrian mall and are built around a green space dedicated to a botanical garden and an open lawn. The botanical garden changes annually and offers a quieter experience outdoors. The open lawn connects to the market district and an extensive plaza with an artistic overhead structure. The market district becomes a hub of activity year-round, housing farmers markets, food trucks, and a wide variety of community events. And finally, the fourth section of the inner core caps the other three with a smaller tree-covered plaza and a densely planted hill to return the district to a lower grade. Although the central core becomes the primary hub for activity within the design, it is far from the only space with importance. The northern site portions house businesses, waterfront townhomes, and a new playground in Clear Creek Overlook. 
as well as a brand new light rail transit system that then connects to the surrounding community. The southern portion of the site includes a new bus station, a home for a variety of businesses, and a large apartment complex with mixed income housing opportunities. A pedestrian bridge over 2nd Street connects the northern and southern portions of the district, allowing for uninterrupted traffic while below while providing easier circulation between the two key areas. Our design builds up community by putting the people first. We want residents to love where they live, business owners to thrive, and visitors to experience the best Coralville has to offer. Our design implements a series of activity spaces with a variety of opportunities, including a market space, um, a versatile lawn for picnics, festivals, and concerts, and several plazas, green spaces, and gardens that can feature local artists or other community events throughout the year. Our district has been designed with comfort and affordability in mind. People will be drawn in and invited to stay a while. On the streets, the pedestrian is put first. Safety and practicality are as important as having a good time. By activating the ground floors of parking structures, offices, and residential buildings, the design can come alive by residents and visitors alike. The core is designed for all types of activity, day or night, and features several options for shopping, dining, and entertainment. The surrounding businesses are programmed for larger grocery stores, pharmacies, and other lifestyle functions. Densifying the site the way we have will provide economic support for our larger moves, including the pedestrian overpass and moving the power lines in order to accommodate the design. Buildings have been shaped to emphasize the first floors, maintaining that smaller neighborhood feeling, while the upper floors have been set back to um, create terraces and other opportunities for elevating, elevated open space, allowing visitors and residents to experience the site at all different levels. And lastly, we know that we're going to have to build up the terrain um, to meet the FEMA and insurance requirements. <clears throat> Doing this, we will have to elevate all of the habitable structures um, one foot above the 100-year foot, uh, foot floodplain, as the other teams have mentioned. Um, although this elevation change will create accessibility issues, um, our, our um, design uh, strives to accommodate these through terraced plazas, um, as shown here. Um, ramps, a pedestrian bridge, and by the creek front, as shown in this perspective, um, an elevated lookout area over the creek. Although the edges of the district also accommodate the ADA accessibility, in some areas, such as here um, in the Market um, Hill, they will implement low-impact development, um, which will help to only not only add um, aesthetic value to the area with dense plantings, um, but also cleanse and um, infiltrate stormwater runoff for the site. Um, next, we have the phasing. Um, as shown here, we just have some broad overall phasing um, strategies within these phases. Um, there will be several things that will have to happen. Um, the first one, we will have to um, focus on the areas that will need to be remediated. Um, the soils, as we know, um, are contaminated um, in some areas. Um, and so those will need to be taken care of first by either capping um, and putting fresh soil on top of it or complete removal of the old soil and putting fresh soil on top of it. Um, we will also have to relocate the businesses within the district um, while that's part of the site in phase two is being built up to meet the FEMA requirements. And then in phase three and phase four, the same thing is happening. Um, so in phase three, those businesses that were relocated within the site would move back into this yellow um, area where there's new development um, to strive to keep the existing businesses within the area um, while taking the other areas and building it up to meet that FEMA requirement. Um, and then in phase five, we would complete all phasing and make sure that all um, businesses are relocated and new businesses could be um, put back into the site. So while design is fun and creative, it must also be viable. For this design, we're proposing that 36% of the site would be residential. The residential space would be split between the townhomes along the northern part of the site and the apartments and apartments that are integrated into the mixed use buildings throughout the site. There is also commercial and office space present that is mixed into the proposed buildings. The commercial space, as mentioned before, resides solely on the ground floor, while the office space would occur on the second and third floor floors of the same building. To support the residents, businesses, and recreation on the site, there are four parking garages placed throughout the site as the primary parking. 
In addition to the parking garages, there is also limited uh, street and surface parking spaces available. As we have mentioned throughout the presentation, open space is readily available for the users and the residents of the area. This space is available through plazas, open green space, program park space, and terraces on the roofs. Okay, so as the new design for the Coralville District developed, it was critical that our proposal maintain a similar feeling to the surrounding neighborhoods. Instead of creating a downtown metropolis, an extensive public park, or a grand shopping district, our team wanted to design a neighborhood that, with time, can promote a sense of place. Together, we designed a district that pushes for a subtle shift towards a denser community, built around a flexible urban fabric and a dynamic collection of open space. Instead of attempting to become some grand gesture through the heart of Coralville, our district builds up com the community that was already there. It builds up the economy of existing and future businesses along the Strip, and it builds up the terrain to help prevent future disasters. The design has the potential to change the identity of Coralville, but that change will happen with the community's input, feedback, and love, not without it. The district is designed to be shaped by the people who live and work within it, growing and evolving as the community does. Thank you. And with that, we'll take any questions, comments, remarks, grand gestures. <laughs> Gotta have some humor, right? Yeah. <laughs> I know we're tired. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, you're, you're, um, Market Hill, or is that the Yes. 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 So why did you chose that particular location for a specific reason, or is that just kind of the way it laid out, or um, kind of to address the uh, university complex or software complex? Um, we went through several iterations of the site, and we really wanted to focus on allowing just one access point off Second Street, and due to that. Um, kind of opportunity, the space in the center of the site really kind of came, became kind of this really crucial part, you know, it's all through our design process. Um, also, it kind of leads into their, that park space that's there. There's like baseball fields and activity. So we're kind of gesturing towards that as part of the extension of that green space. Is that botanical garden that's not enclosed? No. no, so think of it less as like where you grow palm trees and more as where you would grow trees or mostly annuals that aren't native. So it would be the kind of thing where it would change every year and just be a different kind of, it's an aesthetic garden, not a functional garden. Okay. Thank you. Thank you guys. No, there's not. That's the end. I'll just leave it with that. Well, um, Howard Hahn is in the back of the room. He is the uh, co-professor for this studio class. Uh, the two of us taught it together. Also, uh, Carl Smith is sitting in the corner over here. He's a visiting critic who has uh, provided the students with a lot of design feedback uh, in the last uh, in a couple of points through the semester. Um, and the three of us, I, I have to say, are um, impressed with this group of students. This is the first time that they have addressed this level of complexity in a project. It's the first time they've um, used multiple buildings at multiple heights and used them, programming them with different kinds of um, functions as well as thinking about how they activate streets and activate public spaces and squares. It's the first time they've dealt with this level of sophistication in terms of infrastructure and utilities and um, flood mitigation and soil contamination. So this is an extremely sophisticated project for students midway through in their academic career. So I have to say that we are um, very um, proud of them and very impressed with the work that they've accomplished. Um, most importantly to us though is that all of us together, the professors and students, <clears throat> we aspire that uh, this work will provide you all with some ideas about how to proceed with your community. Um, we, we realize that probably none, none of these proposals exactly as the way that they've been designed are gonna be just the right thing, but we do hope that the ideas that are contained here provide you with an opportunity to advance the dialogue about what the possibilities can be. And speaking of advancing the dialogue, I encourage all of you to just cruise on down the street and 
uh, join us at the Reunion Brewery, which is right next door to our study area. So you have a chance to, to maybe stop by the study area on your way there and think of some new questions and uh, engage all of us in a, in a conversation about these student ideas, what their projects, um, how the projects might influence the community and how the, the work that's been done this summer might have an impact in the future. So thank you all very, very much for your time and we look forward to the conversation at the open house. It'll be great information for us to take into the future, and, and as Blake said, you know, uh, take pieces and parts and put them together and really come up with a very unique and very exciting and vibrant uh, development for the city of Coralville. Um, thank you all for being here as the audience and coming in and, and helping us, and we hope that you learned something and enjoyed it. Uh, if you would, we would like to um, take your sheets, if you would, and if you would hand them into us. Uh, we want to uh, collect these and collate them and keep the feedback for us as well as get it back to the students so they know what. Uh, you all thought of their individual presentations. And if you would like this back, you can name it in a number or address or something, and we'll get it back to you after the fact, and so that you can then have that back to keep for yourself. But if, you, if you're willing, we'd like to take these and, and get in close with the information and collect your thoughts. So, and the, the color printouts, those handouts are for you to keep. So, again, thank you both for all your time and all your effort. It's been an interesting and exciting project for me, and I've really enjoyed uh, the interaction. So. Thank you all, and we appreciate your concern for the Southeast Commercial District in Coralville, and we hope to uh, use this, these students' efforts to uh, take it forward into a higher and better thing than it could have ever been before. Thank you. Thank you.